seated. <clears throat> well, thanks for coming out um, <clears throat> on this uh, beautiful, warm summer day. How many of you, I mean, I'm just curious, this has nothing to do with anything, but uh, how many of you, you would rather have uh, 20 degrees and a foot of snow than 95 and sunny? Some sick people. How many of you love the sunshine? Yeah. Yeah, all of those folks are be on my side of heaven. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I hope that uh, uh, this sunshine continues. Today we're going to continue in our series on 1 John. Title of the message is Boundaries, Where to Say No. I've taken this uh, from Proverbs 28 or 22:28 says, "Do not move an ancient boundary stone set up by ancestors." One of the things that God did for the nation of Israel when they left Egypt, He took them and wandered. They were supposed to go into the Promised Land after two years, but because they refused, they wandered for another 38 years, a total of 40 years before they went into the Promised Land. God gave them a Promised Land. It was much bigger than the land that they have now. Matter of fact, probably a 10 to 15 size bigger than they have now. And they'll inherit that one day during the millennial reign. But uh, when they went in, not only did they go into the promised land, but God gave every tribe certain lands. And then within that, he gave every family uh, territory for them to own. And as you know, real estate is important. And owning real estate uh, was important to them. And so in order to know where the boundary lines were, they set up rock barriers. And um, he gave them instructions about this. Deuteronomy 19.14 says, Do not move your neighbor's boundary stone set up by your predecessors in the inheritance you received the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess. So God gave them land, then they used these rock barriers to maintain a clear definition of something that could not, should not be moved. Now, uh, it was tempting for people that were uh, neighbors to people who got old and they couldn't see very well to go out and move those rock barriers and uh, get uh, a few more yards of territory that would have been illegal and uh, unethical and something that God warned them not to do now today in America we are seeing our moral boundaries disappear boundaries that have been set for over 200 years are now being changed they're really disappearing Uh, the moral values that made America great in every area are completely being abolished. In 2005, the Supreme Court ruled that men could marry men and women women, destroying the foundation of marriage. And that is the foundational stone of a society. This all began 56 years ago when they voted prayer and the Bible out of the public schools. Nobody noticed much difference the first 10 years But when those kids went through the schools, went through college, and then began to be teachers, and you have that over and over again, before long you have people who have had no exposure to moral barriers and boundaries now teaching in the public schools. Joseph Fletcher, who wrote the book Situation Ethics back in 1960, I remember speaking about this, back in those days to people that were wondering, are there situations where I can choose my ethics? Well, not if there are moral boundaries that don't move. And so as a result, we have today a society that's debating sexual identity. Can boys be girls, girls, boys? And the whole idea of of, uh, the transgender movement uh, Kids can get in trouble today in school if you call a girl a girl when she is identifying as transgender. 
our moral boundaries uh, are moved, and so moral absolutes no longer drive today's culture. What does drive the culture today? Loud emotional opinions. The louder the uh, opinion and the more vicious the cry, the more attention it seems to get. And that is what's driving all of the moral changes today, is the outcry of people who do not believe in any boundaries. Now, you have to ask yourself, <clears throat> uh, what is a sin? Because there are many people today that would say, no, that's not a sin. I, we don't even believe in sin. So if you don't believe in sin, there's no reason for the cross. There's no reason for Jesus. And so when you redefine what the Bible calls sin, you have a problem. You, you, it's called chaos, and it's called violence, and it's called more uh, rioting and killing uh, without any question because, again, people have been not taught any boundaries. And so you are, and I are seeing the results of people that have moved the fence. Now, <clears throat> all of us, uh, to some extent, in our properties where we live, have some kind of fences. What if you decided that you were going to change the boundary uh, on, on your neighbor? You're just going to move his fence 10 yards in so you could have a little bit more yard for your pets. Uh, how would that work? Well, that wouldn't work very well because you would be sued and you would get in trouble for that because where their boundaries uh, uh, can be moved by anybody, you end up with chaos. So <clears throat> we are seeing the negative results of a nation that no longer has clear moral boundaries. Today, I want to talk to you about boundaries. A lot of this comes out of a book entitled uh, Boundaries, uh, When to Say Yes, When to Say No, and um, it's by Dr. Henry Cloud. It's been out for 20 years, and it's one of the most popular books. It is a book, it's, we have them on sale uh, back there's about 10 copies of them. If you have a hard time, say no. People, you know, keep asking you to do things. Will you come here? Will you do this? And you just are a person that has a hard time saying no. You need to read this book. And if you know somebody that has a hard time saying no, you need to give them this book. Say, you know, you need to read this book. Let me help you. And uh, so boundaries, it is a way to be able to help us to know how to set boundaries. There are many different types of boundaries. Um, there are time boundaries. Teenagers always test time boundaries when the parents say, be home at 11 o'clock, and they are home at 11.30, and they give an excuse. They test the boundaries. And um, they, we have emotional boundaries. We have relationship boundaries. We have moral boundaries, as I mentioned. Every job that you uh, attend have employment boundaries. Certain time you have to go to work, there are certain things you have to do. Those are boundaries that you have to pay attention to. We have health boundaries. We have financial boundaries. And most of all, we have biblical boundaries around the doctrine of salvation. And those are boundaries you better not move, otherwise you confuse the most important truth in Scripture. So your decisions in life determine your values. In other words, where you say no. Now, there's a different kind of no, right? There's no. Then there's no way am I doing that. That's a different boundary. And then there's there no, well, not yet. <laughs> so um, we have boundaries that are made by our decisions. Decisions are made by what you believe. Belief adds to your values what's important. And values drive your action. Everybody operates that way. Belief, values, action. So God wants you to know that your values are... So where do we get our values from? One of two places. Either you get them from the principles of the Word of God or from the opinions of your friends. So you today are driven by one of two things. What you hear by people saying things to you or by you understanding this is what the Bible teaches. And if the, God said it, I'm not going to move from that. No matter what my friends may say or do, 
I'm going to come down on God's side. Now, uh, here's an illustration. John 12 says, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, those are the religious rulers of the day, many believed in him, that's Jesus. But because of the Pharisees, those who were the ruling body in Israel, they did not confess him openly. Jesus said, if you're a believer, you should confess him openly. But they did not want to do that lest they should be put out of the synagogue. That was the place of social acceptance. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. And everybody here, you fall in one of those categories. We know politicians, right? They love the praise of people. And, um, and God wants us to decide, we're going we're gonna to take our marching orders from the word of God and let the chips fall where they may. Now, it's critical to understand why boundaries are key <clears throat> to relationships with God and other people. God created you in his image. He desires you to have a loving relationship with him. And God wants you to know that everything in life that you want in life comes from the right relationship with God. And um, <clears throat> everybody wants peace and happiness. But if you make peace and happiness your goal, you end up doing selfish things. If you're, it is your purpose in life to be happy, be, uh, just have peace, be happy. And so I keep doing things I think will do that. <clears throat> you end up miserable. But if I do the things that God says to do and live for his glory and serve others, I get happiness and I get peace as a result or a fruit of doing those things. So God wants me to know that boundaries are important. Does God have boundaries? Oh, yeah. The Ten Commandments, they're not the Ten Suggestions. Even though the new wave of theology is saying that, they are Ten Commandments, and God wants us to know that if we're going to enter into His love, we have to go through a gate. And that gate is, the only way to go to heaven is through this gate. And the only way to experience God's incomprehensible love. You've never been loved until you are loved by Jesus. And his love is infinite. His love is consistent. His love never uh, de uh, is determined by what you happen to do one day or another. He loves you completely. So how do I get to enjoy God's love? One gate, and it's called Jesus. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see or experience the kingdom of God. And the, and the love of God. So God wants you to know that the boundary to heaven is marked Jesus. Now, <clears throat> today I want you to see some things. One, there are things that we need to let go of. People we need to let go of. Everybody growing up here that wants to have a healthy relationship with God and, and the Lord Jesus, there is one fundamental truth that we run into over and over again. It is this. We see this in Scripture, but here's the principle stated. The people closest to you will always, and I should have underlined the word always, determine your success or failure. So the people that you associate with most in life, they're going to have an impact on how, what you do, what you believe, what you say, and we see that throughout Scripture. Um, years ago, Jim Collins 20 years ago, wrote a book that became uh, famous and it's still on the top 10 business books uh, that people read called Good to Great. And uh, in the premise of his book was this, that if you're going to have a successful business, you need to find the right people and get them on the bus, the bus being your business. Find the right people, get them on the bus. Now, the right people means that you have to find people of character, people of competence they have to be able to have skill and people with chemistry people that know how to get along with other people so those three things make the right people once you find those kind of people you need to get them onto the bus but then he said then you need to make sure that they find the right seat on the bus now <clears throat> that principle really comes out of scripture in first corinthians chapter 12 the Bible says that God likens the human body to the church. 
And he says the church is made up of different parts. And he said in this passage of Scripture in uh, Romans, or 1 Corinthians 12 that the eye cannot say to the ear, I, I have no need of you. Or the hand cannot say to the foot, I have no need of you. And God was saying that different parts of the body are all important and they all play a key function. And we need to thank God for each part of the body. Not everybody was called or gifted to be head of the Vacation Bible School. We thank God for that part of the body. And, um, and if we become jealous of other parts of the body, we end up with schism. That's what he says at the end of, this, of the teaching in 1 Corinthians 12, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. So jealousy and envy divides your relationship of marriage, and it will divide any relationship in a team of people that are trying to accomplish something. So God wants me to know <clears throat> that his, his purpose in life for me is first. If you're here without Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you don't know for sure if you died right now, you'd go to heaven. God wants you to know he brought you here to hear this. God's purpose for your life is to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you don't invite Jesus into your life, you're not going to heaven. Has nothing to do with religion. Has everything to do with a relationship. So once you invite Christ into your life, he also has a purpose for your life. And that is to grow in the knowledge of the Word of God and in fellowship with his people. Those two things work together to determine where God wants you to serve and how he wants you to use your gifts within the body of Christ. And so God wants the church to grow and excel, and that's based upon using people that are here growing and using their gifts as we've seen illustrate uh, in this church over and over again. Now, I could illustrate this from the Old Testament. I don't have time. I ran out of time this morning, so I'm going to hurry to get to the end. But um, we see people like Abraham. We say, well, Abraham really was used of God. He's called the father of faith. What made Abraham? Who was it that Abraham stood on? Um, everybody, if you interviewed successful people, uh, athletes, uh, musicians, anybody that had a pinnacle of success, and you said to them, uh, what do you contribute to your success? All of them would always say one thing. They would look down and say, I, I stood on the shoulders of different people that helped me. Someone poured into my life here, and they came into my life there, and I, I'm standing on the shoulders of people that have gone before me and poured into my life. That's a true principle. Nobody just becomes a success in a vacuum. So <clears throat> what about Abraham? How did he become a success? I'll tell you something I believe personally that I think we're going to see in heaven. The person that really helped Abraham become a success was his wife, Sarah, that gets very little um, accolades and because she, made, uh, she wasn't as faithful in one point of her life, but she was the one that was standing with her husband the whole time. When he said to her, hey, uh, God just spoke to me and said we're leaving and going to another place, she said, well, like where? I don't know. He just wants me to go. I want you to tell you, that took a woman of faith to follow him. And Sarah followed him uh, the whole time and put up with a lot of shenanigans. And so thank God for women, and I have found that it is the woman behind great men. Men of faith, I, I have a great wife. And men that do great things for God have a woman who believes in them, supports them, and helps them. And uh, even then, sometimes they go off the rails. So <clears throat> Abraham had Sarah. David, <clears throat> uh, he was chased by King Saul. King Saul, out of jealousy and envy, tried to kill him. And God gave him a friend. His name was Jonathan. And it helped him survive and, and proceed. Moses had Aaron. Uh, it was his brother that helped him. What about Samson? Samson was a guy that was the strongest guy in the Bible, and he did some mighty things. Who did Samson get his, his strength from? 
his parents. God raised him up from parents that gave him uh, an understanding of the call that God had in his life. And, and he was doing great until Samson gave in to a weakness in his life, a weakness called lust of sex and, and women. And he would not say no. And ultimately, he ended up with the wrong woman by the name of who? Yeah. Isn't it funny how we all know that? And uh, we all know Jezebel. And uh, not Jezebel, excuse me, Delilah. I, I said it wrong. I was thinking of somebody else. She was a wicked woman too. And uh, so Delilah um, was somebody that God used, uh, didn't, God didn't use, and God demonstrated that Samson got sidetracked and lost God's anointing, God's blessing in his life because of choosing a wrong person in his life to be friends with. Well, <clears throat> Um, that brings us to the text. And so let's get started here. Verse 18, 19, he says, Little children, speaking to uh, John is 90, 95 years of age, speaking to all the young Christians in the Lord. Young children, he says, it is the last hour as you have heard that the Antichrist. Now, if he was thinking that Jesus was coming back in his time and that was the last hour, we are in the last minute or the last seconds before the coming of Christ. And uh, he said there is an Antichrist, and then there are many Antichrist. So the Antichrist is a man that will be used by Satan, ultimately indwelt by Satan during the tribulation that will deceive the entire world. And then he says there are many Antichrist that roam the world and preach a false gospel, by which we know that it is the last hour. Then he says in verse 19, uh, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them, same as they, were of us. How many times do you see that word in one verse? Who is the they that he's talking about. These are people that have come into the church professing Christians who then leave the faith and, and uh, uh, abandon Christianity. It's always confusing and disheartening to Christians within the church to see that happen. And I want you to know it happened in Jesus' uh, life group. They had a life group of 12 men, and one of them was a phony <clears throat> Nobody knew that Judas was a phony Christian. You know that? <clears throat> Nobody knew that. The disciples didn't know. He looked like a disciple. He talked like a disciple. He did disciple stuff. But in the end, he, he deceived everyone and, and turned his back on the Lord and sold him out. The disciples never had a, none of them ever suspected Judas. You know how I know that? Because at the Last Supper, right before Jesus' death, he said to the disciples, there is somebody sitting here at the table that will betray me. They didn't all look at Judas and go, yeah, we know. No, no, none of them knew it was Judas. So <clears throat> God wants us to understand there can be people in our lives that we think are, but are really not Christians, even though they say that, and so God wants us to know those are people we need to be careful of. Um, so that brings up a question, doesn't it? How can you be sure you're a genuine Christian? Everybody wants to be sure. And so God wants us to know. And matter of fact, he tells us to examine ourselves here in 2 Corinthians 13. Examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. That wouldn't even make sense if universal salvation was true. Um, examine yourself whether you're in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not know yourself that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. So God wants us to test our hearts to see whether Jesus lives in us. And one of the most famous parables that Jesus gave was about this subject. He said in Matthew 13, 24 and following, 
a parable, a story he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while men slept, the enemy, his enemy, came and sowed tares. A tare was a phony grain of wheat, like a phony Christian. You could not tell the difference until the wheat buds. And uh, among the wheat, and they went his, and the enemy went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced crop, then the tares also appeared. So servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, The enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? And he said, No. Lest while you gather up the tares, you also <clears throat> uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At the end, um, uh, and at that, excuse me, at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them and gather the wheat into my barn. So God gives parables about this story of helping us understand Wherever you find wheat, there will be tares among you. So you shouldn't go, are you, are you a tare? <laughs> no, uh, God, God figures that all out. We are to just serve and love one another and realize that God says there will always be people among, sometimes among the churches or church that uh, turn out not to be our friends and not friends of the Lord Jesus. So how then can you establish spiritual boundaries in your life? Verse 20 says, you have an anointing from the Holy One. You know all things. He's not talking about all things. He says in particular this subject that I'm talking to you about, the Antichrist, you know that he said. The anointing, that word is used so many times out of context. I've had people come up to me after the service and say, oh, pastor, boy, were you anointed today? And I know what they're saying, but um, um, they were saying, I, I liked your sermon better than last week, or today I really got something out of it. But that's not what the word anointing means. And I'll explain that in a moment. And he says the same thing in verse 27, uses the word anointing twice. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. You do not need that anyone teach you, but, um, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things that is true. So God wants us to know that we have <clears throat> this anointing in our life. Here's a question. What is the greatest gift God gave you at salvation? The greatest gift I believe that God gave us at salvation was the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in Romans 8 and verse 8, 11, and let me think, think with me for just a moment. Everybody, all of the believers, millions of believers in the Old Testament, none of them received the gift that you and I have today by the gift of the Holy Spirit received at the moment of salvation but if the spirit of him who raised jesus from the dead dwells in you <clears throat> he who raised christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you and again in uh, second corinthians 1 who also has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee so the Bible says the Spirit of God comes into your life when you know Jesus as your Savior. That always reveals whether you're a believer or not. So God gives you the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do for you when he comes into your life? Three things, real quickly. One, it says, but the Helper, Jesus is speaking to the disciples in John 14. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said. Man, there, you can't believe how many times I say, Holy Spirit, please remind me of what I've studied and bring things to my mind because it gets harder as you get older. 
And uh, some of you go, oh, I, it won't be for me. Yeah, it will. And uh, <clears throat> so one of the things the Holy Spirit said he's going to do when he comes into your life, he's going to teach you. That's why we believe in discipleship, because when you open the Bible and you begin to study, the Holy Spirit can teach you just like the Holy Spirit teaches me. So he teaches us. Second, nevertheless, he says in John 16, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage, Jesus was saying to the disciples, that I go away. For if I go not away, the helper, that's the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he comes, watch, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness of judgment. You know what the Holy Spirit's job is? It is to reveal people's sin. If you're here today without Christ as your Savior, the Spirit of God is convicting you of your need of Christ. That tug in your heart, that, that weight, that voice that you hear, that's His Spirit speaking to you. And He's saying to you, you need to receive Christ. If you're a Christian and you're messing around in the world and with sin and you're doing things that you know are wrong, the Holy Spirit convicts you. That's why Christians cannot have fun sinning. You can sin, but you can't have fun sinning because the Holy Spirit keeps yelling at your ear. Hey, that's wrong. You know it's wrong. What are you doing? And, and so the Holy Spirit convicts us. And so he teaches us. He convicts us. There's a, another thing he does. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will tell you of things to come. Isn't it great to know that the Spirit of God in you can help you with his will for your life? How does he do that? The Bible says in Romans 8 that he speaks to us in our spirit, in our, in our spirit quietly. With a, the Bible says he comes to us in a quiet whisper, small, still voice. And he does that while you're reading. The Word of God, the Holy Spirit will speak to you and share with you his will for your life and the directions that you need to go. So God, the Holy Spirit, is given to us to help us have boundaries in our life uh, to follow the Lord. And um, so what then is the most important spiritual boundary? He mentions it in this text. He says it is the cardinal doctrine. If you're wrong on this, listen, if you're wrong on this, you're not going to heaven, so pay attention. He said, you need to believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. And he says that in verse 22 and 23. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is an antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So Jesus said, if you deny Jesus being God, equal with the Father... You are a liar. He's not very inclusive, is he? That, that we, we, today, everybody's supposed to be inclusive, not supposed to marginalize anybody. Well, I want you to know, God marginalizes people based upon who you say Jesus is. And so he said, you have to be right on Jesus Christ. Now, <clears throat> this is the main doctrine that Satan attacks. Because if he can get you confused about Jesus, it really doesn't matter what else you believe that's right. You're not going to heaven. And so God wants you to be right on this. This is the thing that Jesus was attacked by his enemies during his time. He said this in John 8. <clears throat> the enemy said, are you greater than our father Abraham who is dead and the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus said. If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. And I want to say to you, if you're the only one tooting your horn, your honor is nothing. Jesus said, that's not where I, my honor is not from that. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him. Wow. But I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. Whew. Jesus didn't mix words, did he? And, uh, and so he says, but <clears throat> I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced 
to see my day and saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, you're not even 50 years old. How have you seen Abraham? Watch what Jesus says. Jesus said unto them, most assuredly, I say to you before Abraham was, I am. That is the Greek word for the Hebrew word that all the Jews knew, Yahweh. That meant when God, when Moses said, who shall I tell the Jews, who shall I tell sent me to, to them? He said, tell them the eternal one, Yahweh sent you. And that was the word the Jews would not say. Jesus used that word, and all the Jews knew who he was saying he was because they took up stones to kill him. So Jesus identified himself as God equal to God the Father. He says that here in John 10. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. So if you are a Jesus follower, you follow his voice. And I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Hallelujah. If you believe you can lose your salvation, you have to figure out what to do with this passage. Because Jesus said if he comes in your life, he's not leaving. You are not going to perish. Neither shall any man snatch you out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch you out of my Father's hand. And here's the passage. Watch, verse 30. I and my Father are one. Whatever Jesus is, the Father is. And same with the Holy Spirit. So we believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit as triune God. Uniquely distinct, but one. So God wants us to know the most important cardinal doctrine of all of them is the deity of Christ. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe that. Mormons do not believe that. And so they are not Christian organizations. People that are deceived, if they are in those uh, religions and then profess to be Christians, they're not according to Scripture. Remember, nice people can deny the faith. And... Uh, Here's a great statement to remember. False teachers deny the faith, depart from the faith, and seek to deceive and confuse the faithful. So today I want you to know there are people who are false teachers. They do not wear a placard that says, false teacher! No, no, no. They say, I'm a spiritual teacher. And they use spiritual words like born again. But they just give different definitions than the Bible gives. They use the word Christian, but they don't use the terms that the Bible uses to define that. And that's why you need to ask people to define what they mean by those words. So God wants us to know they are among us today. And he tells us in this text, these things I've written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. You know something? The church today is asleep. You know that? You know what we're asleep in? The message from the pulpit today primarily is Jesus loves us. Let's all hold hands, sing Kumbaya, because it's just wonderful to be loved by Jesus. You know something? Jesus does love us. But he also tells us that if you come into the faith, you join the army of God. You know that? And there is a lot of military terms used uh, in reference to Christians and how they're supposed to live their life on guard, be alert, be ready. Why? Because Satan wants to deceive you and lead you astray and lead you away from the word and from the fellowship of his people. And so God tells us here to be ready. And then he tells us in two passages. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of the Lord Jesus Christ and the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud. Here's the character of these people. They're proud, knowing nothing, but they're obsessed with what? With disputes and arguments over words, from which comes envy, strife. That word uh, reviling is a word means slanders. Uh, evil suspicion, useless uh, wrangling of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is means of gain. So God wants us to know that we should be on guard, 
During the end times, and we are in the end times, it says that false teachers and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonder to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So God wants us to know that we are in a battle. We should be paying attention. So if you are born again, if you're genuinely born again, you will not be deceived because you have a built-in lie detector. Do you know that? You have somebody in you who will blow the whistle on false teachings if you listen. The Bible says, but you have an anointing which you have received from him that abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you. Let me just pause. I said last week, a text without a context is a pretext. It's phony. Here's a great illustration. People will take that little phrase and say, we don't need to go to church. You don't need to go to Bible teachers. The Bible says you don't need anyone to teach you. That cannot be what it means. Because the Bible has designated teachers for the church. Uh, Ephesians 4.12 says that. So he's saying you do not need human wisdom, philosophy of the world to teach you. You have an abiding spirit that teaches you the truth and will help you to know untruth when you hear it. And so God wants you to know that we have um, a, a warning system in our life. But how do you guarantee that a person will not depart from the faith? <clears throat> so I've got um, um, a, a lot of material, and I need to uh, do this in five minutes. So um, there's one word I want you to see. In John 2, 24, it uses the word abide three times. The word abide means don't depart. So it, therefore, let that abide in other words, don't depart, don't leave this in you, which you heard from the beginning. If what you have heard from the beginning abides in you, it remains, it stays in you, you will also abide in the Son. So how do you abide in Jesus? How do you stay in him? The Bible says, and I don't have time to read this text, John 15, it says, abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot produce without being connected to the trunk of the vine nor can you you cannot produce and you can't be fruitful unless you stay abiding with Jesus you do that by simply staying in the word your quiet time is critical don't let something cheat you from hearing from God reading and praying every morning get up spend time with the Lord abide with him and he will keep you where you need to be and abiding in his love and keeping his commandments. And then in closing, God wants you to know not only should you have positive boundaries, but negative things that you need to stay out of your life. And one of those is people that will lead you astray. Again, I don't have time to read this entire text, but you can read it. It's in your notes. I want to point out one phrase uh, in verse 10. It says this, find out what is acceptable to the Lord. God tells you, you are to prove or test or find out what is acceptable to the Lord. How do you do that? You measure things that are said to the word of God. And so God wants you to be careful to stay in fellowship with the Lord. And uh, we, are, we are in a battle all the time fighting against temptations to walk away from the Lord, walk away from the church, get upset. And God wants us to know that we have a responsibility to stay in fellowship, boundaries. Let's bow our heads in word of prayer. <clears throat> some of you are having a hard time drawing some boundaries. And I pray today God will give you courage to say no to the things that are wrong. Even though your friends are saying, ah, come on, try it, it's okay, you can do it once. Have some spiritual, moral boundaries. If you do, saying no will be a lot easier. 
And then God wants us to have clear spiritual boundaries. And one of those is about the doctrine of the deity of Jesus, of Jesus Christ. I need to be right on him. Jesus is the son of God who died on the cross for our sins. And if you don't have him in your life, you're not going to heaven. And so this morning, we would invite you to invite Jesus to come into your life. And then um, God wants us to know that we need to stay close to each other and guard each other and help each other in these times. And I pray today, Father, that you would help us as a church to walk with you, walk in the word, encourage one another, stand strong, realize we're in a battle, realize we're in a fight, that all of the, the demons of hell are trying to remove us from the place of service and place of giving you glory. So may we recognize that we're in a battle and do all that we can to stay close to you. And we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me, um, let me close. I've been asked to read the statement I read last week. Uh, again, to you, we're going to put it on the video so that if somebody that you know was not here, they can hear uh, this statement. Um, uh, if you're a visitor today, I apologize. This is some family uh, business that uh, unfortunately I have to uh, speak into. 1 Corinthians 11, 18 and 19 says this. First, I hear that there are divisions among you when you meet together as a church, and to some extent I believe it. But of course, there must be divisions among you so that uh, those that God approves can be recognized. You know, one of the hardest trials that pastors in their wise face is when people that you love and have invested in their life choose to leave. And over the past few weeks, uh, three part-time staff members resigned and left the church. Steve and Carrie McMahon, Dave and Janet Strickler, and Ian and TJ Robbins. I love each one of those families, and I'm praying for them. I, I, uh, I know that these circumstances always gender up one key question. Why? And in our case, <clears throat> I believe these families were upset with my leadership style. And this is not uncommon in churches. Either as a pastor, you're too weak or you're too strong. Very seldom are you in the middle. And, um, and so this is an, a leadership struggle with some people um, that have left. And uh, so because I'm the senior pastor of this church, it is my responsibility from Scripture to guide this church and make decisions that's best for this body. And sometimes those are hard decisions. I do that with the counsel and direction of our leadership team and a very talented and hardworking staff. And together, uh, we make those decisions. And even with wise direction from so many people, people many times uh, don't see eye to eye. And this uh, has been my experience over nearly 50 years of ministry in every church that I've been associated with and churches of pastors all across the, the country experience this. But in my last 15 years here at Crosspoint, we have had the same form of government and God has used that uh, very distinctly to grow a healthy church. However, even healthy, thriving churches have a turnover every year of approximately 10% of, uh, of the congregation leave uh, people come and go for a lot of various reasons. Most of the time when people disagree with a procedure or ministry, uh, they just decide to go to another church. And um, however, the case uh, of our church is growing rapidly. That 10% can look a lot larger at times. And so Crosspoint, uh, I want you to know, is not a perfect church. Um, you could say amen to that because you're not perfect. And I want you to know uh, I know that I'm not perfect, and, um, and so I'm not here to try to tell you that I always make the right decisions. But Jill and I have poured our life into hundreds of people in this church, 
and we plan to continue to do that by the grace of God. We are deeply committed to Cross Point Church. It is our mission to help people come to know God's purpose for their life in Jesus. You may be asking yourself, how do we move forward given the difficult situation our church is facing? Please know this is not about choosing sides. I still love each of these families and hope they come back. But whatever reasons they made to leave were their own personal reasons. They should not be yours. Instead, please go by the experiences that you've personally had at Crosspoint. How have you been treated? How have you been welcomed? Is the word of God being taught here? Um, and above all, support and comfort one another as uh, this kind of experience is difficult for new families and new Christians. These are growing pains that churches must go through and should not separate us from the Lord nor from one another. We can agree to disagree and still keep our guns pointed at the enemy. Jill and I are asking you for your love and prayers during this time. Though this has been a difficult time, we are excited about the great things I believe God is doing in this church and in many of your lives. And in the weeks to come, we're going to continue to see that. We love you and pray that you will continue to be strengthened and get healing here as we walk through this situation together. And um, so I hope that you know you can come to any of the staff, uh, anybody that's on the board, and talk to them if you have specific questions concerning this issue. So uh, I, I, I hate ending our service on that note, but I needed to do that one more time. Let's stand and sing as we are dismissed today. Hello, I'm Pastor Bruce Spear from Cross Point Church. I want to thank you for tuning in and watching one of our messages. We do hope that the teaching of the Word of God will impact your life and cause you to want to walk closer to the Lord Jesus. I hope that you will also consider supporting the Cross Point ministry so that we can do more for the cause of Christ. If you have questions about your spiritual walk, especially about how to invite Jesus into your life, I hope that you'll call us. God bless you. And again, thanks for watching.